Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your truth. And Father, we thank you for the book of James. We thank you, Lord, those many years ago that the Holy Spirit moved on the heart of James, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus, to write these things down, to write these things down for our learning. And so, Lord, as we carve out the next 35 minutes or so, Lord, would you speak to every heart that is in this room? Would you speak to every heart that is watching? And would you speak to every heart that watches or listens later? Lord, this book is such a great book. It's so practical in our faith. And so, Lord, we thank you. We ask you, Lord, to bless this time in your word, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been going through the book of James, and so we have come as far as verse 19 of chapter 1. And so what I want to do is I want to back up to verse 13, what we covered last week, to kind of give us a running start, give us some context to where we were. And so James chapter 1, verse 13 says this, Let no one say, when he is tempted... I am tempted by God, for God cannot t be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived it, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. By the way, anybody do their homework? Okay. What, I, what was the homework? Second Samuel what? Why do you think I had you read that chapter? Because that chapter is a picture of this verse in verse 15. That when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. So if you haven't read it, I recommend that you read it. Because as we go through the New Testament, you're going to find that the New Testament principles that are taught in the New Testament, they have pictures or stories in the Old Testament that that gives you an idea of what they're talking about, okay? That's why I had you read it. So I'll give you another week. I'll give you another week because I'm a nice teacher. I'll give you another week, 2 Samuel 13. Now, verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. And by the way, whoever read it can come, whoever read it can come up afterwards. We'll talk about it because I want to see if you got what, why I wanted you to read it. Verse 17, every good Every good and uh, perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variance or shadow of turning. Again, you know, one of the things that I talked about last week was that James is making this point. Do not be misled or deceived. Temptation does not come from God. Rather, God gives us good and perfect gifts. He does not change. He is light and hides nothing. And that should be something that should be encouraging to us. Now, verse 18, of his own will... He brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be kind of his first fruits of his creatures. And now verse 19, where we left off last week. Therefore, in light of what I've just said, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Now, you ladies are probably like, wonderful. If you're married, husbands, you hearing this? <laughs> this applies to everybody. So listen to what he says. He says, therefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift. Swift means to be prompt, to be quick. To what? To hear. To hear. Well, what does that mean? Okay, so to hear here, it means to listen, to hear with intention. I will give an example, okay? I am a football fan, okay? Now, during football season sometimes, you know, Sunday evening I'm watching the game and my wife will come up to me and start talking to me. And I hear what she's saying, but I'm not listening, <laughs> okay? For some reason, guys, we have this problem, I don't know, like more than women do. But here's my point. But here's my point. This hearing here is hearing with the intention to listen to what is being said. Now, it's interesting. He says, let every man be swift to hear, so be quick to hear. Well, that's when it says, slow to speak. Now, let's do this exercise. Everybody go like this, touch your mouth, and say, one. Now go, one, two. So you have two ears and one mouth. What does that, what, what does that tell you? Yeah, thank you. Listen more, talk less. Slow to speak. Now listen, something I've learned as a pastor, okay? Sometimes people come up to me and want to talk. And when I was a younger Christian, one of the things that I had a problem with was, 
I had a knowledge of the Bible, so I wanted to tell everybody how much I knew. And so when somebody would talk to me about something, I'd be so quick to jump in there and tell them a bunch of stuff. Now I've learned to listen, to listen. See, it's a lost art to listen to somebody. Because when you listen to somebody, what are you doing? You're listening to what's on their heart. You're listening to what's on their mind. Because here's the thing. If you're talking to a brother and sister in Christ, or maybe even talking to an unbeliever, the point is when you listen to these things, you know where they're coming from. And so God often is faithful to give you a verse or to, to give you words to share with them. But you can't if you're so ready to just jump in and say what you, what you think. And here's the other thing, too, I've learned. Sometimes when you don't listen... You don't let somebody finish what they're saying, and you try to jump in, and you don't even understand the whole thing. That, you don't understand what they're saying to you, okay? It's not about you. If someone is, trusts you enough to talk to you about something, you need to listen to them and be slow to speak. And then it says slow to wrath. Now, that word for wrath is anger. It's a state of fury. Wrath is a feeling of intense anger that does not subside, often it's an epic of epic scale. So slow to wrath, slow to anger. Why? Because if we're quick to fly off the handle, what happens? It brings all kinds of destruction in our life. In fact, put your finger here in James and turn to Proverbs chapter 10. Proverbs chapter 10, left hand turn. Proverbs chapter 10, and just so, uh, you know, shameless plug here, when we get into the new building, we're going to pick up Wednesday night Bible study again in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 10, and we're going to be in verse 19. Listen to what it says. It says, In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. Can anybody attest to that? <laughs> when he says restrain, it means hold back. See, sometimes you don't always have to be talking. I've talked about this before. Has this ever happened to you? You come to church, you have a nice conversation with somebody, and then all of a sudden you run out of things to say, and there's this awkward silence. And then sometimes we decide we need to just keep talking, and we're like, why did I just say that? <laughs> You know, when you, come to a, when you come to a conversation, the end of a conversation, wonderful, God bless, have a great week. That's all you got to do. I've learned this from experience, by the way. <laughs> Another place in Proverbs. Turn to Proverbs 17. Proverbs 17, a couple chapters over. Proverbs 17, verse 27. Proverbs 17, verse 27. Listen to what it says. He who has knowledge spares his words. A man of understanding is of calm spirit. So in other words, look, slow to wrath, slow to wrath, slow to anger. You ever watch somebody have a temper tantrum? You ever watch an adult have a temper tantrum? Yeah. Is that a really good witness to people of Christ? Not really. Have you ever had a temper tantrum as an adult? I'll be honest, I have. <laughs> and here's something, listen, Guys, here's something very practical for you, okay? Here's something very practical, and it's not really funny. There have been times where I've lost my, I've been anger, angry, and my kids have watched me do it. That's hard. That's hard to recover from. Thankfully, my kids have forgiven me, but there have been times where I have gotten angry and I shouldn't have. So you learn, let me turn back to James, you learn to listen. Because see, what happens is when you don't listen, the propensity is what? To flap the handle, right? You hear part of, a, part of the situation, you don't hear the whole thing. Maybe you have a job like that. Maybe you have a high-pressure job. I used to have a very high-pressure job, and people would, would throw things at me, and, you know, and I've, I learned, what I learned to do was listen to the whole thing. Or how about this? Read the whole email. <laughs> Not just the heading. Read the whole email. So in a sense, when you're listening to somebody, listen to the whole thing before you say anything. That's what he's trying to get at, okay? Now, can you imagine, as you read through the Gospels, Jesus, Jesus, yes, he's God. He knows everything. I understand that. But notice Jesus never flew off the handle. He listened. He listened to people. Even knowing everything about them, he listened to them still. See, if Jesus is our example, then we are to follow the example of Jesus. Okay, verse 20. For wrath... For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. That's true. Again, what I just talked about. When you are being led of anger, when you're not listening, what happens is you flap the handle and you probably make a situation much worse than it was. See, it's one of the ways that people know that you're a believer. 
Because when you're born again by the Spirit of God and you've changed, anger no longer has control over you. Listen, there's times where you get angry. There's righteous anger. You know, you see things on TV and there's things that are wrong, that are evil. Okay, there's, there's that aspect of it. However, you don't fly off the handle. Because when you fly off the handle and say things, you say things. Oh, I, I can tell you so many times in my life where I've said things out of anger I regret it saying. But see, again, you can't, through anger or wrath, you can't produce the righteousness of God. See, God wants to produce righteousness in your life, but it's got to be inside out. You've got to let God work in your life. You have to trust him. See, listen, one of the reasons that people get angry is they don't listen, but also because they don't trust God. They don't trust God. Either God is who he says he is and will take care of you, or he's not. It's not that, it's not that complicated. Now, verse 21, therefore, okay, in light of this, lay aside. Now, when he says lay aside, he means put off, stop, get rid of. That's what he's saying here. All filthiness. Now, filthiness in the sense is dirt. It's filth in a moral sense. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Some of your translations, if you have the uh, King James, it says superfluidity. What it means is overflow means an abundance or beyond the ordinary. That's what it's saying here. So lay aside, that is, put off, put off, get rid of, okay? An overflow of wickedness, and then it says receive. Now, that word for receive is interesting. Receive there means to believe, to accept as true. Receive what? With meekness. What is meekness? Meekness is gentleness. It's humility. You receive the word of God. It says, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And that's so true. We're all born again in a sense. We're all saved by the word of God. Because the word of God talks about what? It talks about the gospel. That Jesus Christ came to this earth, lived a perfect sinless life, fulfilled the law and the prophets, was put on the cross, died on the cross, was buried, and then raised again. Resurrection. That is the gospel. And that gospel should affect the way we live our life. It's not just a one-time thing. You receive it. You open your heart by faith. You become born again. And then from that time forward till the time you're taken home to heaven, your life should change. Your life should change. Now, He's saying, therefore, lay aside all filthiness, overflowed wickedness, receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. And that is so true. Now, now, here's the convicting part, if that wasn't convicting enough. And just so you know, if you feel convicted today, I was convicted first as I study. Now, this verse... It's an interesting verse, verse 22, because it's a verse I hear Christians quote, but I don't think they understand what it really says. It says, but be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So what does it mean to be a doer of the word? What it means is to apply the word of God to your life. So listen, you can, and I love the fact you come on Sunday, and eventually we pick up Wednesday nights. You come Wednesday nights. It's wonderful to come and hear the word of God. But here's the thing. When you come and hear the word of God, you then have to allow God to apply it to your life. Because there's things that God says from his word to each of us every single Sunday, every single Wednesday, or every time we get together. Or when you read the word, there's things that God says to each one of us. He says it to each one of us. But do you take it to heart? Do you apply it to your life? Do you say, God, okay, what does that mean for me here? Okay. Maybe some of you need to lay aside all filthiness in your life. Maybe some of you need to be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Do we apply these things to our life or not? See, again, it's something that I can't do for you. You have to do that with the Lord. So when I, hopefully, when I teach on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night, God is speaking through me to you. And if he is, you will feel conviction, you will feel encouragement, you'll feel all kinds of different things. But the thing is, whatever is taught, whatever is speaking to you, you need to apply it. Say, Lord, help me to surrender to your word. Lord, help me to submit to your word. Because it's not going to mean anything. You can sit here till the end of time listening to Bible studies, wonderful. But if you don't apply the word of God, what's the point? See, the application part is the tough part. Because in the application part, Like I talked about last week, maybe there's things that God wants you to get rid of in your life. Maybe there's a relationship he wants you to get out of. Maybe there's a place he wants you to stop going. Maybe there's something online you're doing you shouldn't be doing. And God's telling you to do that and you don't. See, there's a difference. 
you got to apply it to your life. you got to let God apply to your life. Lord, help me to submit to your word. That's the, the easiest way to do this. Lord, I know you're speaking to me right now. Lord, help me submit to your word. But be doers of the word, but but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Because you deceive yourself. When you don't apply the word of God, you let you deceive yourself. You're not good. You're not. Coming to church isn't like I check it off and I'm good to go now. No, that's not how it works. You come to church, why? You come to church to worship God. You come to church to fellowship with other believers. But you come to church to hear from him through his word. Understand. That's why you come. That's why I show up every week. Now, verse 23, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. And he observes himself, goes away immediately, forgets what kind of man he was. So we forget what we see. So you're like, okay, wait, how does this work? Okay, this is going to sound like a silly example. But let's say I get up in the morning to go to work and I'm going to shave, right? So I get up, look in the mirror, I shave, right? And, you know, and then I wipe my face, and I got, like, some, you know, shaving cream on my earlobe here, all right? And I see it. I see it. But then I walk away from the mirror, do something else, and I forget that it's there. And then I show up at work, and people are like, what's going on? Are you all right? You got, like, foam coming out of your ear. Are you rabid? That's usually out of your mouth, but it's out of your ear? You see what I'm saying? Like, It's that basic. You go into the mirror, you look, and then you forget. And what he's saying is you look at God's word, and by not applying it, you forget. You forget. You think if you hear God speaking to you through his word, and you ask him to to help you submit to it, you're not going to remember it now? You will, because he'll change your life. But see, if you don't, you are like a man who looks in the mirror in his face and then forgets what he looks like later on in the day. Again, it's why I have been pushing this, have been kind of redundant and repetitive. You need to read the Bible for yourself. You need to do that on a daily basis, and you need to pray. Remember, read your Bible and pray every single day, and you'll be okay. If you don't, you won't. Oh, I just added on to it. If you don't, you won't. I'm a, I'm a poet. I don't even know it. All right, I'm going to stop, because uh, that's all you're going to remember. Here's something you need to keep in mind. Our faith is active. What you believe will affect the way you live and act. What you believe is going to affect the way you live and act. So like I said, if you believe that God is real, you believe in the things he says in your word, it's going to change the way you behave. I I can't tell you how many times where from reading God's word on my own, from coming to church, there's been times where I've gotten myself in a situation and I remember what God said in his word and it, I changed the way that we handle a situation. I can't tell you how many times it's happened. That should be happening for you too. Should be. Now, two places I want us to turn to kind of point, uh, be an example of this. Turn to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 we're going to be in verse 11, Luke chapter 8. Some of you will know this passage. It's a familiar passage. But listen to what he's saying here. Luke chapter 8. We'll be in verse 11. Luke 8, 11. I'm in John. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Luke 11. Well, let's back up to verse 9, sorry, for context. Verse 9, Luke 8, 9, he says, Then his disciples asked him, saying, What does this parable mean? He talked about the parable of the sower. Okay, a sower is a farmer who sows seed into the field. And so he says, in verse 9, Then his disciples asked him, saying, What does this parable mean? And he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest is given in parables, seeing that they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now this is the, par- the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes the word away out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Then he says, but the ones on the rock 
are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and, f- and these have, not, have no root, who believe for a while and in time of temptation or testing fall away. We've talked all about that the last couple of weeks before this week. Fall away. Verse 14. The ones that fell among thorns are the ones when they have heard go out and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of life brings no fruit to maturity. You ever been choked out by the cares of this world? Verse 15, but the ones that fell on the good ground are those having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it. You hear that? They hear it and then they keep it, which means they apply it to their life. and bear fruit with patience or endurance. You say, well, you know, James said that. Well, Jesus is saying this. It's important. Now, another place to turn. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Matthew 7, verse 24. The context of Matthew chapter 7 is the third chapter with regards to the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 Listen to what he says. He says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, in other words, whoever hears my teaching is what he's saying, and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rain descends and the floods came and the winds blew and beat that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. In other words, there's a strong foundation. See, if you build your life on the foundation of Jesus, or the foundation of God's word, your life, when the storms of life come, you'll be good. But... Now, everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does them, or I'm sorry, does not do them, sorry, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. See, here's the contrast here. Either you hear what God says, and you build your life upon what he says, you'll be on a rock, you'll be solid, storms come, you'll stand. But if you don't, if you listen and then don't do them, you're like a person building on sand. You ever build a sand castle on the beach? What happens when the water comes? <laughs> wipes, wipes it right down. You know, you spend hours building this like, castle or this like, wow, this is elaborate, and here comes the water. Up, oh, it's gone. <laughs> Just like that. So if you hear God's word and then don't build your life on his word, you're like building on sand because then when the storms come, your life's going to be done. You won't be able to stand. You won't be able to endure. Verse 28, to finish this. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that his people were astonished at his teaching. For he had taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So now back to James 1. So again, verse 21. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his face his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But, listen to what he says here, but but he who looks, when he says looks, he means not just looks, but continues in the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not forgetful here, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. He goes on, If anyone among you thinks he is religious, now that word for religious, you know what it means? The word for religious is the only time it's used in the New Testament. It's this Greek word, it means this, it means uh, careful uh, attention to the externals of divine service. See, religion is your external service to God, right? That's what religion is, that's what being religious is, okay? If anyone among you thinks he's religious, listen to this. So if you think you're religious, you're doing all the outward religious things you're supposed to. You come to church, you do whatever, you pay the tithe, you do whatever, okay? You do all these religious things. Then it says this, and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart. This one's religion is useless. See, bridle, the the word there, bridle, the idea there is restrain. Do you restrain your tongue? So it's like this. I come to church. I'm a Christian, right? I say I'm a Christian with my mouth. I come to church. Then I leave here and I start yelling at my wife right after the service. You ever do that? Or how about this? You're driving into church. You're coming to church, and 
you are getting into an argument with your wife and you're yelling at your wife, you're mistreating your kids, you're yelling at them, and then you come in and go, oh, praise the Lord, brother. <laughs> See, the religious outward external says, oh, I'm a Christian. Inwardly, you're rotten. See, so many people in this culture think that if I do this outward thing, I'm good. No. See, God wants to do an internal thing, an inter internal Okay, he wants to work from the inside out. I've talked about this before. The culture has this thing where they think you can change from the outside in. You can't. You can change for a little while, but it's never lasting. So you have to allow God to work in your life. So you hear God's word and then you submit your life to it. Then it's an internal work from the out or inside out. That's a lasting change. Hey, I used to know this guy. I used to guy this Bob. I'm making it up. So if you're a Bob here, don't worry about it. Um, now, Bob's different now. Bob used to curse all the time. He doesn't curse anymore. Well, Bob used to yell at his wife. He doesn't yell at his wife or kids anymore. See, it's a sign that God's doing a work in his life. That's what it should be for all of us. So if anyone among you thinks he's religious, and here's what I don't understand. Here's what I don't understand. I know people personally who say they're a Christian, yet the way they talk to their family, man, oh, man, I can't believe it. And I don't mean profanity. I mean disrespect. I mean dishonor. I mean just downright mean and rude. I don't get that at all. That means, what does it say here? It says, if anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. In other words, it's empty and there's no purpose to it. What are you doing? You know, I believe it's in Isaiah where God tells the people, he says to them, listen, you worship me with your mouth, but your hearts are far from me. Yeah, are you like that? Are you a professor? of Christ. You come in here, you say you believe, I'm a follower of Christ, but yet your life shows you're not. What does your life look like? See, I told you this is going to be tough. <laughs> and you think it's tough, it's tough for me too. <laughs> Trust me. Here's something to consider, guys. True religion, true religion is evidenced in your actions, but your actions match your words. In other words, you walk the talk. I love the Lord. Okay, does my life look like I love the Lord. Does your life look like that? See, I don't, I don't know what you do outside here. I'm not the government. I'm not the NSA. I don't know what you do as a joke. I don't know what you do. But God watches everything you do. He knows everything. You think you're going to hide from God? You're not. He sees it all. He knows, the very, he knows all the hairs on your head. You know that? Boy, if he could do a barber, that'd be awesome. Be a barber or a haircut person. Anyway, he knows the hairs on your head. He knows it all. He sees it. So where you think nobody sees, he sees. He sees. So don't, stand, don't, don't say, hey, I believe in you, I follow you, and then you're doing something totally contrary to what he tells you to do. See, this, this faith of ours is not complicated. It's pretty easy, guys. It's pretty easy. See, it's easy, it's easy when you do this, when you yield your life to God. When you yield your life to God. See, I, I, as a younger person, and I think this is more of a problem when you're younger because when you're younger, you got energy, you got strength, you got physical strength. So you're like, I don't need you, Lord. I can do this. You know, I got physical strength. Then as you get older, then your strength starts to wane, doesn't it? Your strength starts to wane. You don't have the strength anymore. <laughs> like, I'm exhausted this morning. And that's when you're at your weakness, your weakest, I should say. But that's when you need to rely on him even more. See, you, if you get in the habit, if you're young here this morning, if you get in the habit of leaning on God and looking to him and, and submitting your life to his word, I'm telling you, your life is going to go so much easier. It's going to go so much easier. It doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. It's going to go easier. So when the trials come, when the testings come, as we've been talking about a few weeks ago, you'll be able to make it. You'll be able to make it. But if you don't do that, you're going to fall. Then he ends this um, section, and we're going to finish chapter one. All right. Pure and undefiled, that is free from contamination. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans. When he says visit, he means take care of, 
look after, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself, what does it say? Unspotted or spotless from the world. See, look, there's actions to our faith, okay? So not just be a doer, apply it to your life. And if you apply the word of God to your life, it may make you to go what? Visit orphans, help a widow. See, that's practically showing your faith. See, because this is what happens. If you hear God's word, and God speaks to you, and you say, okay, God, help me to submit my life to you. And maybe in submitting his life to you, he wants you to go visit somebody. I can't visit everybody. Maybe God wants you to visit somebody in the fellowship. Maybe, maybe God wants you to help somebody financially. I don't know. But see, if you have a relationship with God, and you are submitting your life to his word, then there's going to be a change, and you're not just going to be here, but you're going to be a doer. You see how it works? That's how it's supposed to work. And for all of us, it's going to be different what, he, what he's going to ask you to do. Can I tell you, and, and I've said this before to you guys, and, and I mean this when I say this. I can't tell you the blessing it is to serve God. I can't tell you how much of a blessing it is when you help other people. See, when you help other people, what are you doing? You're fulfilling what God is asking you to do. But not only that, here's, what's, here's the amazing thing when you help other people. You may be having all kinds of stuff going on in your life, okay? Stuff, the enemy might be stirring stuff in your life, but you serve God and you help other people, it takes your mind off all of that. It takes your mind off all of that. I can't tell you the joy it brings when I know that what I'm doing serving God is, is touching other people and helping them. Because ultimately what you're doing is you're pleasing God's heart. You're pleasing God the Father. You're fulfilling the will he has for your life. But also, too, I'm being a hearer of the word and then a doer as well. That's what he wants from us. And it's not because, it's not because like, he, he wants to tell us what to do in a sense. He wants to tell us what to do because he, he knows the blessing it comes with. He wants to bless you. See, we, we want to be blessed. Who doesn't want to be blessed? Raise your hand. Okay, nobody raise your hand. <laughs> if you want to be blessed, then serve God. If you want to be blessed, listen to what he's saying to you and submit your life to it. And God will bless you. Amen? All right, we're going to stop here this morning. Let's pray. Well, here, I want to read something to you. Sorry. <laughs> I think this is a good summary to what I just talked about, okay? So it is not enough, listen, it is not enough to receive the implanted word we must obey it. There is no virtue in possessing the Bible or even reading it as literature. There must be a deep desire to hear God speaking to us, an unquestioning willingness to do whatever he says. Do you have that in your life? God, I will go wherever you tell me to go. And everybody says, I don't want to do that because it'll send me to Siberia. Don't worry about that. Okay? We must translate the Bible into action. The word must become flesh in our lives. There should never be a time when we go to scriptures without allowing them to change our lives for the better, to profess great love for God's word, or even to possess uh, as a Bible student is a form of self-deception unless our increasing knowledge of the word is producing increasing likeness to the Lord Jesus. That is the point. To go on gaining intellectual knowledge of the Bible without obeying it can be a trap instead of blessing. Can I tell you that's how I was when I was younger, guys? I'll confess that to you. I will confess that to you. I had a whole bunch of Bible knowledge, and I couldn't wait to tell you how much I knew. But you know what's funny then? God allows testings in my life. God began to break the pride in my heart. I began to rely on him. I began to let the word of God be applied to my own life. See, it's always easier to point somebody else's sin out when you first need to let the word of God point your sin out. If we continually learn what we ought to do, but not do it, we become depressed, frustrated, and callous. You guys feeling that tonight? Or tonight, this morning? Maybe that's what it is. Impression, listen, impression without expression leads to depression. Nice little saying. I didn't write this, somebody else did, okay? Impression without expression leads to depression. Also, we become more responsible to God. The ideal combination is to read the word and obey it implicitly. Okay, God, I'm going to listen to what you're saying. I don't understand it. I don't 
know what this is going to mean for my life, but I'm going to obey you and listen. And I'm telling you, you're in for the adventure of your life. God's going to bless you and he's going to help you. He's going to change you. Let's pray. Now I promise we'll pray now. <sighs> Father, we thank you again for your word. Your word is simple. And Lord, like I said, <laughs> you're God, I'm not. And you know everyone in here. You know what's going on in their life. You know those, Lord, here this morning who are pretending. Lord, it isn't about condemnation. It's about growing. It's about knowing you more. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning, Lord, who you're speaking to right now about these things, Lord, would you help them? Would they be honest enough before you and say, Lord, I need you. Lord, help me to submit my life to what you're saying to me right now. Help me, Lord. I need you. Help me to do this. I can't do this on my own. Lord, would they do that this morning? I also pray, Lord, for anyone here who does not know you, who says and comes back every week, but says they know you, but they really don't. Lord, I pray that this morning would be the day where they would say, Jesus, I acknowledge the fact that I'm a sinner. And Jesus, I know that you died on the cross for my sins. So Jesus, forgive me of my sins and be the Lord of my life from this day forward. And if they have pray, prayed that prayer, I pray they would tell me or somebody else in the fellowship. Lord, you love us so much that you don't want to leave us as we are. You want to change us and make us more into the image of your son. Lord, as challenging as this was, you're there. You're there for us. You want to help us. We just got to cry out. We just got to ask for help and you'll help us. So Lord, I pray for every person in this room this morning that, Lord, they would get in the habit of not just hearing God's word, but being a doer. In other words, Lord, submit in their lives to what you say in your word. Would you help us all to do this, Lord? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.